morning. Hey, it's great to be here. I was listening to an amazing speech, so I hope I can add a little bit for you, okay? I think I have like 40, 45 minutes, and I would like to align a little bit on Agile, what Agile is, and why do we really need it. And then I would like to go into the area of transformation and what does it take. There was already some news on the transformation five minutes ago. And from there on, I want to take a brief look with you into the future, what Agile will bring and where Agile will go. So here we go. Um, I think it's like 20, 25 years ago that at least where I lived, every one of us had materials from Kodak. You know, they used film rolls or other materials to use. If I am informed correctly, it means, you know, that from that perspective that Kodak was one of the global leaders and therefore they were innovating a lot. When they were innovating, they were part of, you know, innovating the digital camera and the digital photography. Today, Kodak is not so big, and it's still there, but if you look in the world of photography, Kodak is not the player that it used to be. If you look at Nokia, for example, in 2001, when we wrote the manifesto, I work in a company, approximately 700 people, and I think almost everyone, 99% or more, had a Nokia. Two, three years later, let's, I think it's 2003, four, five, Nokia was you know, disappearing, you know, vanishing from the face of the earth. Why? They missed something in the market happening. They missed an innovation. Um, BlackBerry took over, if you remember well, you know, with a little trackball in the middle. And what I, what I want to express here is that if we talk about Agile, and we saw it in the previous talk, what you do is you make your organization ready for change. You make your organization in such a way that you can respond to the change that's out there. Now, what's happening is that if you keep on focusing on a bit of your organization, your organization itself is still you know, slow. So you need to do it all together. And for example, Nokia missed an innovation, the innovation of the smartphone. BlackBerry missed the innovation of the touchscreen. They were having it as a product, as an item, but not putting it on the market. This brings me to the point that Agile, number one to understand, is a corporate capability. It's something that you do together. You cannot do it on your own. You can get it on your own and do, get some benefits. But if you want to have corporate benefits, it means that you have to do it all together. When I started working differently, it was in 1994, um, we said to each other, you know, if you do a project, if you, if you do a new delivery, Maybe six months, but no more. Within six months, you need to be live. Today, the world is different. And technology is evolving in such a way. The pace of innovation is so fast that whatever product that you have, whatever service that you have, you have to realize yourself it is having a shorter life cycle than before. And a shorter life cycle than before means that not only you have a different way of developing the product, but also while the product is live and you know the product life cycle is short, what you do is you already start preparing for the future. It means that everything that you do has to be faster. And it's even worse, it not only has to be faster, it also has to be with a better quality. Because if the quality is poor, people will leave you. The digital highway is fast and there are many places to go. If I just look at myself, you know, I spent half my life on airports, so I ordered a lot online. And I can, I can share with you here, there was one of the, the fashion brands uh, two weeks ago, I was at an airport, and I was just, you know, boring myself and uh, Googling, and I saw this very nice polo shirt. I thought, oh, that's nice. So I ordered in the store, I ordered my polo shirt. And I, you know, I know which size, because I have more stuff of this brand, and, and then I wanted to pay, swipe left. The payment didn't work, I leave. It takes 10 seconds, I'm out, I'm going to the next one. And it counts for most of us. So what we have is that technology and innovation goes in such a way that the product life cycle or any product or any service you know, is shorter than before. Also, it's not only in you know, IT, as we used to think 20 years ago or 15 years ago, but it's in every single professional domain. So product life cycles are shorter, and also the te technical highway that we have together is facilitating global competition. So this means 
that you have to be very alert because in the past you might have known where the competition is or was, today you don't know anymore. And the competition, before you know it, is faster than you are. So whatever you do, you have to make sure that you have a much shorter life, uh, sorry, time to market than in the past and also with a very good internal quality. Now the point is, if you put this you know, on a list, what it means is that you want to make sure that you have a way of working that takes out any kind of delay. And we have so many you know, hidden ways of building delay in the way we work. And you see them on screen building up now. But the first one is we have so many misunderstandings. And it's very simple. Your misunderstandings are made so easily. Right now, right here, I am talking. And every single one of you is listening, or maybe on your laptop or on your phone, I don't know, but let's say that you're listening and you make interpretations of my word. My words, those interpretations for every one of you are different. And most likely every one of you has different interpretations from what I actually mean. And the most of you might be really close, but the way we communicate, we build in easily mistakes, <coughs> sorry, mistakes in interpretations. The moment that we have remote and written communication, which means that I make a design document and I send it to you, and then I wait for you for a you know, question or a review. No, this process on itself is already you know, building in delay because I make the document, it takes a lot of time, I send it to you, I have to wait for you to have time to read it because you're busy, you have other things in your inbox, then the moment comes in that you, you have read it, you send it back, but I'm busy too, so I take my time to read your feedback on my, so this is, your, you have interpretations, you have delays, both of them are not helping in a shorter time to market. The second one on screen here, the efficiency, is part of what I was just explaining, but even more. Um, maybe you know, maybe you are familiar with the waterfall. In 1994, I was working in a waterfall process where um, uh, I was part of a technical design team. So we had analysts, and they would make an analysis report, and they would hand over the analysis report to the functional design team. The functional design team would hand over the functional design to me. I would make a technical design out of it and I would hand it over to a developer. Right? And after a while I was thinking, and this was the last project that I did in a waterfall environment, and I was thinking, okay, so here I am, you know, I get a document, I make another document, hand it over, but I think this person over here, the developer, is very capable of reading the functional design document. And the information that I add, he has the information as well. So maybe, maybe we should take out my time here as a te technical designer and add it to the development capacity so we have one full-time equivalent of extra development capacity, which means that it would help to speed up. And I was not alone in the technical design team. There were more people. So we were leaving out a lot of capacity to develop, and that means time to market. And also there's a thing that's really going on in traditional ways of working, and also what I see very often still in, um, in, in what we call agile environments, you know, where we create a sequence of work. So here we go. And here we have the client, right? The client comes in and we have an interview. And what we do is out of the interview, we make a document and we hand over the document. To, so here we have information analysis, functional design, technical design, we have uh, development and we have test and we have operations. Let's do a very simple se sequential model. So we make again, we make a document out of it. Again, you know, we make a document out of it. And then finally we start developing. Now what happens is very often that we interview here and we fix this information and we translate continuously into other documents, right? So the first problem is we fix it. Now what happens if someone has a better idea? We have fixed information, we need to change, we have a heavy, heavy change process. If it gets really worse, we have even a request for change. One of the extra problems is that like the client is asking here, he said, hey, at the end of the line, what is the time that you need? When can you deliver? And the moment, the moment that we have this delivery date set, we are bound to it. And the problem is with the delivery, we make a planning based on an estimate. Now, what do we know about estimates? 
estimates are wrong. And that's because they are estimates. It's not a calculation. And even if you make a very smart formula out of it, the parameters in the formula are variables. So an estimate has mistakes. That's why it's an estimate. We think it is more or less like this. But we, we are taken hostage by this timeline that we set. Now, here we have a mistake in the planning, so it takes a little bit more. Here we have again a mistake. It takes a little bit more. It takes a little, even more, more, more. And by the time we are here, time is out. And I've been literally in situations where we originally, in a large waterfall project, originally had three months of testing, and everything was more, so we had requests for changes, and you now we didn't go to the change advisory board and get extra stuff in, an extra budget in, but the deadline was still the same. And the solution to be on time was, okay, instead of three months of testing, we do one month of testing. And this is what happens. So we have a process here that builds in errors. It builds in bugs. That's a very nice screen. Uh, oh, that's better. Um, the point is, we want to avoid delay, right? So if you have a process, and you know if I work in this process, I'm building in the bugs. My client will be unhappy. It will be Ari sitting on an airport, you know, trying to do the payment of his new polo. Swipe left, out. That's what you don't want. So you need to fix this. So Agile is not a choice. It's mandatory to survive the future. And people who say no, I got questions the last week, said, okay, you know, we have big projects like this or big projects like this. Even building a submarine is helped by working in an Agile way. And Agile is not one thing. There's so many things in Agile, but you know, taking out the useless delay Delay is always useless. That's the one we should aim for. And you take out the delay because if you deliver the wrong functionality, that's one you need to rebuild to bring in the proper functionality. If you do a lot of redundant work, you just make the time that you deliver late. And if you build in bugs, you need to do a lot of rework before you really can go live well. So those three are elementary to working agile. And that's what you need to do. Now, if you hear me talking, what is the most important problem here is you know, finding time to communicate. Because I can send you a document, and you can read, and then you do, you know, you know this, in MS Word, you can do track changes, or you can make notes in there, right? So you can do feedback in a Word document. But even if I send you this document, and you bring me your feedback, you know, written in, you made interpretations on my written words, and I make interpretations on your written feedback. So I stake an interpretation on an interpretation, which is double wrong. So what is more easy than sitting at the table together? So when I started doing this differently in the second half of the 90s, my first commercial project was early 1995, it was for me, ah, okay, good, great, you know, and it worked. So I did project number one, you know, on time, within budget, and a very happy client. Project number two. Project number three. And I said, okay, you know, this is easy. This is the problem. Because the way of working is easy, but it's changing the way that people have worked so far. And there is the problem. Because people yeah. don't like change. Because people people are like to be in a safe comfort zone. Because companies have developed quality management systems or whatever, where they tell you step by step exactly what to do and how to do it. It's not in there, so we don't do it. I've been in a situation where I was the only one delivering successful projects, and they stopped my way of working because they said, it's too complicated. I said, okay, well, why is it complicated? It brings success. Success should be the driver for doing things. Okay. But it's not really. So I said, okay, if we can stick to the, to the interaction of people, and the right people, not the wrong people, the right people, people with knowledge, and people who are empowered to make decisions on behalf of their peers, or their peers, or maybe the business, for example. Then you can go somewhere. And so we have, we have three types of interaction. The first one is focusing on the content of the solution. So you sit at the table together in a workshop, a nicely facilitated workshop, where you have all stakeholders together. And for those of you who work agile, please note it's not about a team and a PO. It's about a team and the business. 
It's very important if you stick to the interaction concept. You say, hey, you know, I want to take out the delay, that you understand that if you have the business here, and you have a development team here, and you put a product owner in the middle, the only thing that happens is that we have interpretation one, and then we have interpretation two, when things come back we have interpretation three, and then we have interpretation four. That doesn't work. So real agile means that instead of doing this, we say, okay, you make a team in a shared responsibility. So you need to have people at the table who actually are going to use that solution, you are going to use that product or service. Now the question is, are those people the only stakeholders? No, they are not. Point is, a stakeholder in the way of, if you want to avoid delay, a stakeholder is someone who can stop the team. So if I go down this line, who can I meet? People who can have an authority to accept, or even worse, to reject what you have made. And who can it be? I've been in situations, well, if you take this as a timeline, that you could work with the business here, you do your delivery, so you talk with the business here. But then you don't, you finish, the business is happy, and then we have the legal department who wants to check, we have the marketing department who wants to check, we have the operation department who wants to check, we have the architecture department who wants to check. So the point is, if you want to deliver here, and if you don't want to have a delay, you have to make sure that you take people from those departments who are empowered to make decisions, and they say, okay, we participate with you from the beginning in the process. So that if you're making something, we can continuously check with you and see and give you feedback if it's not according to the standards or the guidelines or the rules or legislation or whatever you, you talk about. And that's a bit more than having a product owner in the team. That means an extra pressure on the shoulder of the product owner because this is the person who is responsible for mobilizing the right stakeholders and to have a vision. And if you work in a little time box of two, three weeks, you know, you have a couple of times where you meet each other. It's like every two, two, maybe three days that you talk together. Small feedback loops. There's a nice group, it's called fast feedback, pays off. So the point is, if you have those content sessions, now we know that we're on the content side, we are safe. Now we know we can deliver the right moment in time. You know, the, the, the material, the service that we want to deliver, because everyone will check for that. I looked at it and said yes, or given the feedback and we took it back into the way of work. <coughs> the next one is we talk about the progress. How is the team working? And the funny thing is if you give someone 10 days to do a job and you ask at the end of day one, how are you doing? People say, oh, I'm okay, I'm good. How far are you? Oh, 10%. And if you ask on the third day, hey, how are you doing? You say, yeah, I'm okay. How far are you? Yeah, I'm 30%. That's great. And on day four, they're on 40%. Day five, they're on 50%. On day six, they're on 60%. Day seven, they're on 65%. <laughs> day eight, they're on 65%. <laughs> day nine, they think they're on 50%. And day 10, they go, no. <laughs> right, that's where we are. So the point is, this is personal private people. It's, this is not bad. You give a job to someone, and someone says, hey, I have a personal pride, I want to I wanna fix this, I want to do this. It's something that's very human, it's in all of us. So we have to break that circle. So what we do in Agile is every morning, beginning of the day, we stand together and say, what have you done yesterday? What do you want to do today? And do you have any kind of impediments, hindering or blocking you? So instead of waiting for nine days to get here that we have a problem, now within a life cycle, almost real time, of one working day, we know if one of our team members has a problem. And together as a team, we can help this solve. So instead of waiting for nine days, within a day it's solved. That's how we want to work. That's how, why we do the daily. So the reason I say this is that I meet people, say, hey, we're going in agile working, and we have all those little workshops. You have dailies, and retros, and demos, and heartbeats. Um, but uh, you know, I have to do the real work. So we do the daily once a week. The point is, you have to understand in agile working, the interaction is where we do the real work. 
because between the interaction moment, you diverge, you, know, you do your own job, you work on it, you produce, you work, and then in this workshop, you converge, you check as a team where you are, and then you diverge again. So in the progress, you do it on a daily basis. On the content side, for those stakeholders, it's every two to three days, diverge, converge, diverge, because if I take too much time, the amount of rework is too big, and it creates delay. Agile is about avoiding delay for three reasons. Remember? Now, this one here is very important. And, and this is, if you talk about agile working, um, because the light, I can't see you, but I assume we have people from my team, but also people, I hope, from the business here. And we all are busy in the way we work today. You have to understand that in this you know, little time box that we use in working as like two or every three weeks, the only real way of agile working is at the end of two or three weeks, we have something that is potentially shippable for production, for go live. Last weekend I was back home in the Netherlands and I was reading you know, Instagram and stuff and all of a sudden I saw an uh, uh, expression from Jeff Sutherland, who's one of the other authors of the Agile Manifesto, and there was something like, if you don't deliver at the end of your sprint to operations, you have a sprint fail. And that's what something to think about. So, we have to do it all together. This means that if you're from the business, if you're from the legal department, if you're from HR, if you're from marketing, if you're from IT, if you're from operations, from architecture, you do this together. Agile is a corporate capability to deliver fast. The time to market is short, better value with a better internal quality. Now people say, you know, as well, you know, we, we do this, we do that, there's, we implement safe. That doesn't make you agile. Agile, when we wrote the manifesto, when we were in Salt Lake City in 2001, 17 men. And every one of us had made a choice in the past, my choice was in 1994, to work in a different way. I made my choice because I was doing a project for the Dutch IRS, the tax agency. And we worked from November 1993 to May 1994 in a wonderful project. This is where I was a technical designer. And then all of a sudden the project was, as we say, the project was killed, cancelled, stopped. So we had seven months, 30 people, full time work, stopped, never been hard again. For me, it felt like waste of public money. I don't know about you, but to me, ethical and moral, that's a problem. Wasting public public money should be taken care of very carefully. Public money is that you something that you use for healthcare or for education. Now those kind of things. But you don't never ever waste it. And my my change was can I find a way to deliver better value? So that I know that if I bring something out of a project or a newspapers, the digital newspapers, they were four weeks ago and they were nine weeks ago. In the full government, I know from the last nine weeks, just 165 million euros of projects cancelled, wasted. For me, bringing value is extremely important. The saddest story this year is that in early 2018, there was a governmental organization with 2,000 people, only 2,000 people. And they defined a project with an estimated budget so they made a real budget proposal for it, 36 million euros. So that's like 43, 44 million dollars. Within six months, they said, oh, uh, you know, 36, sorry, it's not enough, it's 95 million euros. And then another four months later, they said, oh yeah, we need another 25 million euros. This is for a 2,000 people organization. Then they said, okay, now we stop the project. The government stopped the project. Already 65 million was spent on not to be used. There's no reusable item in the work so far. They wasted, if you calculate, over 30,000 euros per employee. Waste. So we have a long way to go. You think, okay, we're done tomorrow. No, you're not. We have a long way to go. Point I want to make for me was, and still is, value is an extremely important driver. Because as long, even if it costs a little bit more, and you don't want to go over budget, of course not, but even if it costs a little bit more, and you bring exactly the right value, that's good. Then you get return on investment. Right? But other people were focusing on quality. I was working with James Brenning a couple of weeks ago in the Dutch office of Humanity, 
And James is really much focusing on quality. James says, hey, I'm a software engineer. I want good code. That's all I want. I want it to work. I don't want incidents. So we had a focus for his change in 1998 on quality of code. Other people said, hey, we focus on efficiency. And then on top of this, we had different sizes of the groups that we focused on. The point I want to make you, so for example, you know, pairing or, or two people or one person, quality, okay, you have practices in the agile method of extreme programming and tech driven development. If you say, hey, I'm looking for efficiency here, really helpful. One of my clients said, hey, I'm a tech company, innovation is my lifeline. So I want to go into agile transformation to be an agile company, and the time that I say that I want to use for innovation, because that will help me to survive in the future. Okay, so okay, if you want to do this on the team level, there will be a lot of scrum, because scrum on the team level will give you a lot of efficiency. I was doing agile PM you know, in the late 90s, focusing very large groups, I had project teams, 20, 30, 50, 80, 90 people. So the point I want to make is Agile is not a thing, Agile is not a method, it's just a concept. And if you are a practitioner, if you are going to be a practitioner, you want to know from all those you know, Agile methods, you want to know what practices there are so that you know if something is not working properly and I'm looking for an improvement, you can say, okay, I take this practice. And if you don't know it yourself, don't you worry, there should be an Agile coach in your company that says, hey, I can help you out here. Do your retrospective. And I'll join you, and if this is the problem, then I have a practice that will help you. And that's a little bit more than doing Agile and being in front of a plan board at nine in the morning. It takes a little bit more. It takes knowledge, and it takes learning. I think one of the big characteristics of every Agilist is you're always open for learning. You're never done learning. I saw a previous presentation, so on screen, you know, a transformation is never done. Perceive it as your own Agile transformation. Once you're in, you never get out, because you keep up the learning. I was with a client in Bucharest, and very big written on the wall, this quote from Winston Churchill. And I loved it. So, so you're standing there, so the place where you have the central room with all the meeting rooms around, so I'm reading it, and look at this. They say, now perfection is not a state. Perfection is an ambition. You know, and and if, you, if you want to be perfect, it means that you need to, you know, to change a lot, because it's an ambition, you need to get there. So perfect people change a lot. Now, if you just change perfect to agile, that's what we're talking about. This also means that if you, if you look at what agile really is, of course it's about doing you know, dailies and having a plan board, but it starts with a mindset, with a corporate mindset. This is about changing altogether. And I have, I have very strange situations over the last 25 years. I've been in situations where management teams, 25 people would invite me into their meeting room, to talk about Agile, I come in, and literally after two minutes, they interrupt me, and they will say, that doesn't work for us. Well, oh, that's funny, did you try it? No, 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 but it doesn't work for us. <laughs> or the worst one, you know, it doesn't match our culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is culture? Culture is just an empty word. Culture is like a bucket. It's an empty word, and you fill it up with people and habits. That's the good news. The people is you, right? You can change if you want. You can change if you want. There's nobody, you, you cannot change someone else, but you can always change yourself. So if everyone takes his own responsibility to change, there you go. I'm writing my book at the moment, publish it in four to six weeks, and it's called, You Are the Architect of Your Own Life. And what I want to say, it's not about being ill or getting hit by a car, not about this, but in business environments, in, in family and friends environments, you make your decisions. Don't say, yeah, I did it because you. Because if you do, so, do something, I still have the choice to do or not to do something. That's my choice. It's my responsibility. So if I'm in a company environment, if I'm in a working environment, and I see something that's not working properly, I can make a choice. I can make a choice to change. Right? And this is where it starts. And I, was, I had the privilege a uh, couple of years ago, like 10 years ago, I had the privilege to be with Mr. Kofi Annan at the table. He used to be the chair of the United Nations. And we had a long talk, like an hour and a half. And I had, at that time, two boys, 13 and 17. And I asked him, I said, you know, it was about, you know, being in political, you know, difficult environments. We talked about 
uh, Myanmar at the time, I was an economic man, and I asked him, what if my children, if my boys, what if they see an opportunity to help people there? There's an economic man. What do you think they should do? And he said to me something that I never forget again. He said, change always starts with one person. So don't let it stop you, right? You, you can initiate change if you, yes, people call you an idiot. I've been there, you know, called me an idiot and a liar and a fraud. But if you believe something, the change in 1994 brought me where I am today, right? So there's something good in being different, right? It's not that bad. But it's, if you, if you take the mindset as a beginning, some people ask me, okay, well, you have that transformation done, and we are sort of ready, transformation is always ongoing. But I think that you did a major thing. If everyone in the company realizes, okay, we have to go through these interaction moments, and we are open for continuously change and improvement. It's not done. It's not, no, it's not a state. It's an ambition where you continuously change to get there. It's not easy. And the biggest problem is that as you are working with the interactions and empowered people, and different ways of documentation is rocking the cradle. It's changing things that most people have been used to for decades. If you talk, I'm 55. You know, the worst ones to do a transformation with, don't tell anyone, okay? The worst ones to do transformation with, guys over 50 with gray hair and a beard. They are the worst. And why? They are in the company for 20, 25 years. And they are so used to do this in this old way. It's in their bones, it's in their muscles, it's in their thinking, it's in their dreaming. Do you come in to change that? Yeah, it's not easy. But it has to happen. Right? And that's the thing that we talk about. I put some paradigm. The word paradigm means a perception of how things are. And the perception of how things are, if you go into an agile transformation, will change. And I give you one very simple example here at the top. My progress report, if I work agile, is on the wall. I have a plan board, I have a burn down, I have a burn up, and I have the full backlog of posters on the wall. And every day we update it in the daily. So if you want my progress report, go in my team space, look. I'm not going to write you an MS Word document. I can send you a photograph if you like. <laughs> And that changes the way you think. Of course, you can do this digital. I was in Moscow with a big bank, and they had this massive program of 1,500 people working, and they had all those visualizations of the program that you update every day in the morning. They had them on a big flat screen, square screen like this, and there were all those visuals of all those teams were on there. And the only thing that the program manager did was walking in in the morning, and he would look at the old, everyone, instantly you could see which one was going well, and which one was, there's no, no need to write five pages of progress report per team. I think it would take them half a year to read one progress report per every team. Right? You save time, you avoid delay. But people are so used to use them as work. I've been in situations where we have this you know, progress report on the wall, and people start retyping the information in them as work. What are you doing? They are making the progress report. They hate over there. That is shifting a paradigm. You know what paradigms do? Paradigms define your reflexes under stress. <coughs> so what happens if you do something for the first time? It's not brilliant, right? If you are a brilliant football player, now we're going to learn you how to play basketball. Listen, you know, you're not going to be a brilliant basketball player instantly after two days of training. So you do things, you try to do things in a new way, and they go wrong or not you. So what do you do? You grasp in your brain for a solution. And what does your brain know? The past. So what you do is, you step back in the past. I've been in situations where I did an agile transformation, everybody was working agile. Two years later, I come in, they're using all the agile words, and they work completely old school waterfall, like a, you just made a drawing on the board. <laughs> now this one, no, not this one. And that's what it does. So if you go into a transformation, you have to understand, you know, if you, if you try to find a solution for something that's not going well, that you innovate forward and you don't innovate backward. Find an agile coach that will help you. So here, I'm going to say just one minute about changing a paradigm. 
If you go into radio transformation, you're making a corporate paradigm shift. That's what you do. You shift paradigms. That's difficult. So first of all, in synchronize, you have to align together and say, okay, you know, this is this is how we work. And every two weeks we can redefine this, but you have to find a way how to work together. Because it's different from the past, so you need alignment, synchronize. Then you need a coach. And in the follow phase, you follow the coach. It's like a sports coach. He's on the side of the line and he's shouting you know, where to go and what to do. But after a while, you know, if you know how to play the game, it's the other way around. The coach can sit down on the bench and just before the game, during the break and after the game, he can give you some feedback, and that's okay. Right? So you lead yourself. This will take time. This cycle, if, it, if our coaches, our coaches can have four teams, what, let's say 25 to 30 people in one cycle. Cycle is team up, so it's not an easy job, right? Point I want to make is it's going to be different. And I'm sadly to say that the same Dutch IRS that I was already talk about, talking about were very proud that they implemented Agile without changing the organization. That's not how it works. It will change your organization. And that's not bad, it's, it's for the good. Because that will help you to survive the future. Right? Now the point is, how do you build this together? There are a couple of things that are really, so you do it all together, right? Agile work, this is really important to understand. And I like to make this drawing where I say, okay, this is where we are, this is the organization, here we have the top, and here we have the teams. Here we have the middle management, sort of, sort of a model. The point is you do agile in the vertical and you do agile in the horizontal. And it's very important in this way of working that you understand that management has to lead by example. If you show traditional behavior over here, you will get a traditional response over there. Can I get my screen back here, please? So the role model of the management is extremely important. And in this whole situation, we have this point that we have the silos, right? So we have uh, silos, let's say, uh, for example, uh, analysis, design, uh, test, or uh, marketing, or HR. And then we have, of course, we have in every silo, we have people who are responsible for that silo. And you need to collaborate in that, in that situation to break the silos. Because I was just talking about all stakeholders. And it's not that if I'm running a team and I have someone from the legal department because we have a product that we make that's with a strong legal component that a legal silo manager is taking out this person out of my team and it's sort of some full agile process. This person needs to, this manager needs to support this change. And it means sometimes that you have to be courageous. And it's okay to disagree. And it's okay to say, sorry, no, I wanted to do this today, but it was too complex for me. And that should not be something to be punished for. It should be, okay, thank you very much, now we know. So you have your learning, and we as a team, we can solve it. Now we can move forward. And instead of being late, we just avoid the delay, because we have very early in time, we know in the team that we have a little impediment. Right? So you have to be courageous. And just know that sometimes you hit the wall and it's difficult, but it makes you stronger. Once you bring the trans you know, to the transformation process, let's say as a team, or in the role where you are, whatever you do, you have to do something to sustain that change. Very important. And self-reflection, don't, don't point at someone else. If you point at someone else, three fingers are pointing at your own, right? So don't point at someone else. Try to, okay, what can I do better? And you can bring it into the team, and maybe the team can help you with the solution. Agile coaches will help. They will help you to sustain the change. They will help you to avoid to innovate backwards. They will help you to innovate forward. And knowledge sharing is extremely important. Knowledge sharing is on a regular basis coming together and okay, let's we, we are both developers, you're on your side and your technology on my side and my technology. Let's share. What have we learned? What can we do better? What have I found? Impediments and solutions. What have you found? Impediments and solutions. Maybe you have a solution for my impediment. Right? So knowledge sharing as part of the operational process 
is essential. It doesn't mean a meeting a year. It's on a regular, can we meditate? We have every two to four weeks at least. We have people you know, sharing knowledge together. Every three months, everyone sits together in the international context. We are in seven countries. We have a buddy system where we have buddy calls, talk about you know, issues and solutions. Mentoring systems, on a daily basis, we share knowledge. Growth and development should be part of the daily process. And also in the HR area, an agile professional is different from a traditional professional. You have a different profile, different skills, different ambitions, and different. in the past, you know, I was, I was here working in this model, and this was also a career path. So you started the age, so for those who are in operations, I'm so sorry, but if you were in operations, it means that you didn't know a lot. And if you know a little bit more, you became a tester, and then you were a developer, and then you got a designer, and it was really awesome. And we know that those people are so elementary to the success of what we have. I had co colleagues that were going, you know, from, they had to make a promotion from, from uh, uh, developer to designer. And they said, yeah, but I don't want to make, I don't have my promotion. I just want to be a developer. That's what I like. You know what they said? You have a lack of ambition. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know that we, you know, we need so many good developers, right? There's always a shortage of developers. So HR is going to be different. Now, if you look at Agile tomorrow, um, I think HR will be the biggest component. Because that will, if you have, I work in so many organizations where people have an individual target and individual bonuses. Agile is not based on individual tasking, but is based on team delivery. So if I have individual bonuses and team delivery, it's, it's contradictory to each other. So I need to change rewarding models. I need to change career paths. So things, that, that will be the next step. On the business side, corporate agile. I see too often IT only. And getting the business in, taking the pressure of the product owners to get the blame for everything, that's where, and also, it's not about, only about the blame, but what it will do it, it will bring the real business value. <coughs> because there is no one as good as the business itself, who knows what they need under their fingertips to get the value that you're looking for. <coughs> you have to stay competitive because the pace of change will never ever slow down. It will only go faster, faster, faster. So the capability to be able to respond to that change will only become more important. So we have to work accordingly and nothing else. So sit down and relax is maybe what you can do on a Friday evening with a glass of wine or somewhere in the pub. But it's not what you do at the office. You don't have to run around like an idiot, but you have to build together that corporate capability. That will be your tomorrow. <coughs> and I, I, I like a, a quote, no, it's not a quote, it's more, a, a, I paraphrase Richard Branson from Britain. And he said to tell you, so what do you think about your customers? And I don't think about my customers. I don't. I think about my people. And my people will think about the customers. Right, so a company, should take care of its people. Fulfill your ambitions. If you want to be the ultra developer, awesome, we need you to go there. Hey, if you want to be the analyst, you know, tester, great, awesome. So there, is, there should be place for everyone in this ambition. And the funny thing in Agile HR will be that instead of in the past, where you are squeezed as an individual into roles that you maybe even don't like, what will happen is that you can develop yourself based on your ambition and on your capability, what you like. So, from my perspective, Agile is the way to go. It makes you future-proof. That's the quote that I like to say already for a long time, because it's that corporate capability. To do that, you need to change the mindset. You need to change the culture. And change the culture means changing you. And the good news is you can change yourself. Thank you very much.